Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Akka, Spark, or Kafka, Selecting the Right Streaming Engine for the Job. My name is Oliver White, Chief Storyteller and MC at Lightbend, and joining me is my favorite streaming expert, Dr. Dean Wampler. He's our VP of Fast Data Engineering at Lightbend, not to mention a physicist, author, speaker, and excellent photographer. While I take a moment to introduce today's session and allow any latecomers out there to get their popcorn ready, I'd like to ask our audience a quick poll question. And as an incentive to share your experiences, we'll be mailing a Lightbend t-shirt to a randomly selected poll respondent. If you're joining us today, then possibly you are in the same position as a lot of us out there who are realizing that the batch-oriented architecture of big data, where data is captured in large scalable stores then processed later, is simply too slow. So if you're looking for a competitive advantage like our clients, PayPal, HPE, Starbucks, and Capital One, then you've got to embrace streaming and fast data architectures where data is processed as it arrives. But for most people we've talked to, there's rarely a one size fits all technology that can handle all streaming use cases. So with so many stream processing engines out there, which ones should you choose? There's a few things to consider when making the right selection, such as latency, how low is necessary, Volume. How much volume are you expecting? Is complex event processing involved? Integrating with other tools, which ones, how? Data processing in bulk as individual events, what other kinds, etc. And this is why Dean is joining us today, to help better equip you with the context and background to make good decisions when it comes to adopting streaming engines. Using our fast data platform as an example, which supports a host of reactive and streaming technologies like Aka Streams, Kafka Streams, Apache Flink, Apache Mesosphere, I'm sorry, Apache Spark, Mesosphere DCOS, and our very own reactive platform, we'll take a look at how to serve particular needs and use cases in both fast data and microservices architectures. Today's webinar is made possible only by Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, especially our client Pivotus Ventures, a company that's, that helps financial service providers offer smarter and more human options to their clients. Based in Menlo Park, California, they're looking for a lead site reliability engineer with experience in Java, Scala, and Akka so that you can help scale their infrastructure to a whole new level, I think. You can find out more about this position and other open positions with our customers and partners on lightbend.com under the company tab. As always, this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with you next week. If you have questions for our speaker, feel free to add them to the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll see if we can get around to them in the Q&A part of today's session. If you're an existing subscriber, then you can directly access our developer assist program where our expert engineering teams are available to help you address any additional technical questions, how-tos, best, best practices, and what-ifs. All right, that's all from me. So let's finally hear from our special guest, Dean Wampler. Hi, Dean, thanks for joining us. Hi, Oliver, uh, it's good to be back. Um, uh, thanks everyone for coming in. Um, this is an updated version of a talk I did uh, maybe a year ago now, uh, kind of reflecting uh, our evolving thinking about how to do this stuff properly. Um, you know, the core ideas are kind of the same, but there's a lot of refinement that we've done to our thinking based on working with customers and uh, really seeing the strengths and weaknesses of various tools. So that's what I want to kind of uh, leave you with today. Uh, and let's get the right button. There we go. So um, it, also, this is based on a report I did uh, some time ago called um, you know, Fast Data Architectures for Streaming Applications. Uh, this link at the bottom is actually the, the uh, a landing page for the Fast Data platform that I, I lead the development team for. Uh, but it has a link to get to this report if you'd like to uh, get some more details than we have time to cover today. So let's uh, put this in context a little bit. This will be fairly quick. I think most of you probably have dealt with uh, one way or another with classic uh, batch architectures like Hadoop. But some of the, the main reason I'm going through this is to uh, show how some of the ideas from here are carrying forward, but they're also being refined. Um, this is a schematic diagram of what a Hadoop cluster might look at, look like. You know, we've got uh, storage, which could be the Hadoop distributed file system, but people also use things like S3 uh, search engines like Elasticsearch and, and databases of various kinds. 
uh, then you need something that can actually process this data that, you know, the, you, you land the data, as uh, Oliver said, and then you want to process it later. Originally, it was MapReduce. Now, Spark is used a lot for this. There's, there's other tools. And then there's layers on top of these tools, like SQL environments, such as Hive. Uh, and then the other big piece of the Hadoop ecosystem is Yarn, yet another resource negotiator. It's like sort of a first-generation resource manager. More modern versions of this concept are Mesos and Kubernetes, for example. And then for completeness, I added a couple of other popular tools for getting data into the system or even exporting it. Scoop is great for databases, and Flume has been popular for log aggregation purposes. But uh, you know, as we discussed, it's it's kind of um, maybe a competitive disadvantage if all you can do is wait for these batch jobs to run to analyze your data. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to you know turn off your Hadoop clusters. There's still plenty of use for them for things like data warehousing, a kind of you know after the fact uh, exploration, analysis, reporting, and so forth. But if you want to get answers out of your data more quickly, then you need something that, you know, this buzzword fast data architecture has emerged. It's basically stream data processing. Uh, this diagram is taken from the report. It's a bit busy, but we'll go through the pieces of it. Uh, the numbers correspond to uh, numbered sections in the report. I have tweaked the diagram a little bit. It's, this is a slightly updated version, um, and I'll get to the, those details as we go. Uh, so now we're going to have data coming in, you know, in real time, uh, and I'm using that term very loosely, real time. It, it could be streams of data like uh, sockets. Here I'm kind of using this as a placeholder for anything external to my system, such as the Twitter feed. It might be a uh, log exhaust, either from uh, you know, server logs or even things like clickstream logs I'm going to analyze. And some of the data even comes in through classic uh, REST requests, where you know, I might be processing user sessions, but at the same time sending that data to my uh, data stream processing pipeline for doing things like machine learning uh, recommendations and all that kind of stuff. So what we've seen emerge here is that uh, building stream processing is not only different in the sense of now I'm doing things faster compared to Hadoop, but it's actually raised the bar on the kind of services we build in terms of their um, production profiles. They need to be scalable and resilient and durable. And you know, I'm going to stand up a stream pipeline that could run for months. Uh, it's going to encounter almost everything that could go wrong, you know, network partitions, hardware failures, et cetera. So resiliency becomes a much bigger problem in stream processing versus batch processing, where you know the batch job might run for hours and it might process terabytes of data but it only needs to last for those few hours, and then I you know, run another one later. So that's kind of forced these architectures for stream processing to look more like what we've learned about uh, service architectures, like microservices, um, you know, CI, CD pipelines, all, all the buzzwords that you're uh, perhaps used to if you come from that world. So um, we do find that a lot of these systems need to be built with those kind of capabilities in mind. And as a corollary, if you're, you know, if you're trying to get answers out of your data quickly and exploit it for advantage, that means you have to integrate your, your existing microservice infrastructure with your data processing infrastructure so that you can get that data into your services as needed. So the, we see these sort of uh, converged architectures emerging where I've got a bunch of microservices running. If I am using something like Mesos or Kubernetes, where I can literally run everything on top of one big cluster, uh, then I might be running my entire world on that one big cluster. And you know, hopefully not. I mean, there's still reasons why you might have uh, duplicate, uh, duplicate clusters for resiliency and whatnot. But nevertheless, it's more of an integrated picture than having like a, a Hadoop cluster off to the side, so to speak. Uh, Zookeeper is usually part of these sort of things for you know federating masters and storing uh, shared data. Uh, and in fact, it's mostly here because Kafka uses it. So Kafka has kind of emerged as a very hot item in this space because it's a great data backplane. Um, it is uh, loosely speaking a message queue model, but it's really more of a log aggregation model where you you collect this str these streams of data in topics that would be analogous to queues in a message queue, but you actually traverse them differently. It's much easier to have the data stored in Kafka and then have multiple people traverse the same data, even go back and reread it and so forth. Uh, and then it does this very well at large scales and um, you know, large volumes of data. Uh, you know, LinkedIn likes to point out that they're now running you know, well over a trillion messages a day through their Kafka infrastructure. So, you know, it's got these capabilities. 
So I really like Kafka for this kind of backplane that you need. And, and the other bit advantage of Kafka, I think I have this on the next slide, is it architecturally solves some problems for you. One of which is that uh, I, I've deliberately drawn this uh, you know, complete bipartite graph, I to use the technical word, uh, to kind of illustrate a worst case scenario where I have a very complex uh, connection topology and it's hard to understand, but it's also rather fragile. You know, suppose that service one on the right hand side crashes, you know, I could have data loss if uh, I have these direct connections from all these other sources and that data is now getting dropped or, you know, whatever it was that service one is doing, it can no longer do this and it won't be able to pick up where it left off whenever I replace it. So as we all know, we, we solve any problem in computer science with another level of indirection. Uh, and this is what Kafka does for us in this case. By having this in the middle, uh, we've uh, gained a whole bunch of advantages. We've simplified things architecturally. We have one sort of uh, universal way of connecting things together. You know, I, I, if ser the services on the left only need to understand the Kafka APIs, they don't have to understand a particular ad hoc REST API, let's say, that all the services on the right support, for example. And if we have the scenario where something crashes, well, the data will be reliably captured and um, you know, the, the services on the left won't have to even know that something went wrong, that whenever I restart service one after it's gone down, it'll just work. Um, so it's, it's a, a very uh, well uh, thought out architectural piece of our system and, and adds a lot of value. And then we, uh, sort of analogous to what MapReduce and Spark were doing with HDFS and the Hadoop world, uh, we've got all this data that's flowing through Kafka and maybe going into storage uh, on the lower left, but uh, what am I gonna do with it? So we looked at the landscape of streaming engines and there's a whole lot of them that claim that they do streaming and we tried to decide what, you know, if we give you the minimal set that covers the full spectrum and tools that also have, you know, like a very vibrant community and seem to, you know, be like they're gonna be around for a while, then we, we settled on four, um, Spark, Flink, Aka Streams and Kafka Streams. And we'll spend most of our time talking about the qualities of these engines and the, the kind of requirements that they satisfy. And Beam, we'll get into a little bit as well, why that's here. And so just to finish the diagram and then uh, before we get into streaming again, uh, it's, it can be bring your own persistence. Uh, people do use HDFS here. It's still very useful, but and all, actually all this, this, this box, uh, box is actually the same as it was on the Hadoop slide. Pretty much all the same persistence engines apply. It's a little bit different if you're doing stream processing. There are some new engines that are a little better at managing streams and others, uh, more traditional databases that are getting better at, at handling streaming data. Uh, and then the last thing on this uh, chart is, you know, where are you gonna run this stuff? Well, it's really all pretty flexible. It's, it's really somewhat agnostic to how you run it. Um, obviously, I mentioned that Mesos and Kubernetes are newer, more mature systems uh, that give you much more flexibility for running a wide class of, of uh, applications and services. Uh, Yarn has been catching up to some degree, but I think I think the days are numbered for Yarn in terms of uh, you know building these kind of new generation architectures. But you can run this stuff anywhere you want to on you know on premise in the cloud, whatever. Okay, let's uh, get to streaming engines then in particular. And to start, what I want to do is talk about the kind of requirements you should think about when you're picking an engine uh, or features, if you want to call them that. Uh, here's the list of them, and I'm going to go through these uh, one at a time, so I won't read this list now. Let's start, though, with low latency. You know, how, how low, what's your budget for processing before you have to have a result you have to send downstream? Um, and it can you know, range over quite a spectrum. If you're doing what is truly real time, and we tend to uh, abuse that term, but if you're talking about pico to microseconds, like, you know, flight control software, like the SpaceX diagram, well, you're probably talking about custom systems that really are outside the, the scope of what we're really interested in today and that most of us have to worry about. You know, you're using custom hardware, low-level C programming, and so forth. When you start to get into the range of under 100 microseconds or so. Uh, you can actually do some of this with, uh, you know, very fast JVM libraries, you know, uh, very uh, effective use of even some REST protocols. Uh, this is more the domain of regular trading as opposed to high frequency trading. And if you're working on 
like diagnostic me uh, medical devices, you know, this would be the kind of uh, time frames where you'd need to you know, be responding. Uh, 10 microseconds, and the reason there's pictures of credit cards here is uh, I once had a chat with um, some people from a bank who were responsible for authorizing credit card transactions for major websites. And they said, you know, when you click buy on a website, you know, there's all kinds of steps that that chain of uh, the transaction is going to go through. And the usual rule of thumb and usability is that you need to get an answer back to the user within, say, 100 or 200 uh, milliseconds. Um, and actually, there's a typo here. This should be 10 milliseconds, not microseconds. But uh, they s told me that their uh, their budget, that the time they had to actually authorize the card was 10 milliseconds. That's how long they had to make a decision. When you're getting into the realm of hundreds of, of milliseconds, now it can be you've got a lot of flexibility. If you're serving a dashboard, you know that's obviously not a real time problem. But you know, human attention, you'd like to get, let people know within some reasonable amount of time that something's going on. If you're training machine learning models uh, or even scoring in some cases, then you often need more time because these are more compute intensive models. And then as you start to get up to seconds to minutes, now you're in the realm of like model training where I don't have to, I don't have, to have my model up to date like to the second necessarily, but maybe within a few, every few minutes or this could actually go much longer, even hours. You know, spam filters don't need to change very fast, but they do need to change pretty regularly. Or if I'm doing classic ETL where I'm, you know, just ingesting this data and I want to park it somewhere, then a really nice use for Kafka streams, for example, is like processing raw data and then putting it into a much nicer format for downstream consumption. Again, typically not something that necessarily requires low latency. And, and to be frank, if you're going above like a minutes or so of latency, remember I mentioned how hard it is to make microservices run and stay healthy for months. Well, you're probably better off maybe just doing periodic short batch jobs if, if your latency is really quite long. Uh, that'll actually be more likely to stay healthy for you just to periodically kick things off that are short running. All right, the next topic would be what's your volume? You know, how, how much, vol how much, it really, this is probably, it should be velocity actually. How much data are you uh, processing in some unit of time? Um, a lot of what we're, we've built in the past, especially if you've worked on websites or whatever, you know, 10K, 100K messages per second might be kind of typical. Uh, you, you, if you use REST carefully, like non-blocking REST, you can meet these requirements pretty easily. You typically uh, uh, scale in parallel to uh, kind of address these, these needs and also provide the resilience that you need. Uh, when you're getting into the realm of you know, uh, millions of events per second, then you need to be a little bit more careful about the design of, of having non-blocking services. The reason the Nest thermostat picture is here is um, uh, Nest was implemented in Aka, and they once told me that they a uh, really interesting problem. Uh, every day and every time zone, at, you know, between like 6 and 7 a.m., they would get this big spike in traffic. Is that that's when people got up typically every day in those time zones, and then there would be this you know, big spike of traffic as the uh, environment flipped to sort of daytime settings. So they had to do all kinds of stuff to sort of uh, broaden and, sh and uh, flatten that, that uh, uh, bump of traffic. This is a great place where you'd want to use non-blocking uh, non-blocking services like Aka messaging and so forth. What kind of processing do you want to do on the data? What kind of analytics? Uh, a lot of people like to use SQL. And this is kind of amazing to me, actually, that you can understand why people would want to use SQL in a batch context, because it's a great, concise way of asking questions of data. But it's actually emerged as a popular domain-specific language for stream processing. So I'm uh, you know, if I'm just a guy who's writing some jobs that uh, need to do some analytics on the fly, but I'm not a great programmer, it's actually really nice if I can use SQL to express the job because it, I may know that language much better than, say, Java or Scala. So here's a couple of examples kind of made up of, you know, doing a group by over uh, the zip code for some IoT data, uh, both with a SQL query on the left and on the right, I'm using the Spark uh, DSL that I might use to uh, write it in, in Java or Scala code. 
data flow process. And here I'm thinking about a, a sort of a factory model where I, I'm going to send the data down this pipeline, and at each stage I'm going to do some sort of a transformation, filtering, you know, splitting it, and so forth. Uh, th this happens to be a section of an implementation for the inverted index calculation, if you know that calculation. But I highlighted in red the kind of operators, you know, each stage of this uh, factory and, and how I might process data as I go. We talked about ETL earlier as a typical kind of very common, if, if mundane, sort of data processing where I might have data that needs to be transformed, uh, cleaned and transformed into a, a format that's more useful downstream. Um, and then finally, obviously of great importance these days is uh, exploiting machine learning. And there's really two phases to this. One is your model training, which presumably you want to update periodically, either in, in some sort of streaming way, or if it really doesn't need to be updated that often, you might do this offline with batch tools, but then somehow integrate those model updates into your pipeline that's then going to uh, serve the model or score data as it flows through. Another interesting decision point is, uh, do I need to process these things individually? Uh, and I like to use the word events for this, something that has a unique identity, unique uh, sense of importance, and I need to do some complex event processing with it. Or is it more like bulk records where I can kind of operate on things in mass in some way, even if I actually in practice do it one at a time, but I'm sort of thinking about the, these kind of uh, operations in bulk, not so much treating each uh, record as the term I'm using here uh, with some sort of individual identity. Now, of course, in a real database, most records have an ID. So I could say, you know, select uh, where this ID happens to be some value. But mostly in the streaming context, we don't think that way. We just think of structured data flowing through the system. And we might want to do some bulk operations on it in, in some sort of small window of time. Getting near the end of these requirements. Uh, this one is actually new uh, to, if you've seen this talk before, I began thinking about how really ACA streams and Kafka streams are fundamentally different from Flink and Spark in the following way. ACA streams and Kafka streams are libraries that you embed in your applications. And that gives you a lot of flexibility and freedom, especially for integrating other kinds of processing into this flow that's also doing streaming but it also puts more burden on you to actually run th things. Whereas Spark and Flink run as services that you start up, you know, these just regular Unix kind of demons, and you um, submit work to them and they figure out how to distribute it over the cluster, uh, monitoring job execution, task execution, to make sure that things are restarted if they fail. They do a lot of work for you, but it's a more constrained uh, model, so it may not be as flexible as you need. All right, with that, let's talk about the four streaming engines I mentioned, actually, and the fifth one as we go. So we'll, we'll kind of zoom into the diagram here a little bit that was on the right-hand side. The reason Beam is on this diagram is because Beam has emerged as an extremely influential streaming engine in terms of what the semantics of streaming should be. You know, what, what, if I want to do as much processing as possible in a streaming context, what are the sort of things that I have to account for? You know, do I process things in, in like Windows? Uh, what do I do about data that arrives late? All, these are the kind of questions that the, the Google Dataflow team, which uh, basically Beam came out of that, what they, what they uh, went through thinking about these problems over a period of years. The way they did it, though, they actually open sourced the top end, which is the Beam semantics, the Beam API, where you define these data flows for processing. And then you run them with another runner like Flink or Spark, unless you happen to be running in Google Cloud, in which case you would use Dataflow. And today, Flink is the most mature runner that I know of in terms of, of supporting most of the Beam semantics. Um, so Beam is really defining the state of the art. It's very influential in how all of these engines are implementing their capabilities and meeting the needs of people. It, I'm not really sure how much Beam will actually get used in production. There are definitely some big production users already outside of Google, but it may be more influential in its ideas than actual use. Uh, and just to give you an example of uh, what I was referring to as semantics, you know, let's suppose for the sake of argument that I'm, I'm actually doing accounting 
calculations every minute for some reason. Maybe I'm calculating how many items I sell of, a, of each SKU in my catalog per minute. And if you think about how the data is going to travel over my cluster to the whatever node is doing this calculation, you know, because the time of flight is not uh, infinitely fast, um, there'll always be some delay. So some messages will arrive in the next minute rather than at, by the end of the first minute when I, when I, when I tr uh, trigger this calculation. So uh, like in this first uh, column, I have three events on server two and one on event on server one. But I illustrated that one of those events on server two will arrive late. So what do I do about this? Well, Beam thought about this, uh, and it gives you ways of specifying how long to wait, what to do about late arrival of data, when to say I'm not going to accept anything that's you know, beyond a certain date, and so forth. Now, so you know, here I'm illustrating just the normal state of things where just because of you know, network time, network latency, I'm going to see some delays. But it would be even worse if I, if let's say server two was uh, lost to me from a net because of a network partition. It's still running, it's accumulating data, but maybe hours later uh, I'll, I'll start to see its data instead of you know microseconds later or something. This is just a taste of what they've uh, been thinking about in, in that project and, and how other people are starting to now adopt uh, these ideas. So uh, Apache Flink is a project uh, based out of Berlin, and it's it really started as a low latency streaming engine. And when we get to Spark, we'll talk about how it actually started as a batch engine and the implications there. I think it's of, of the ones we're going to discuss, it's the best beam runner. It, it has a, a mature uh, SQL engine that uh, actually came out last year and is widely used now as the programming API, so to speak, in some large companies in China. Um, so Flink is one of these tools that you might pick if you're mostly building a streaming pipeline system and you don't necessarily need a lot of like spark batch mode kind of stuff, in which case, um, you know, you might decide we'll just use Flink for this problem and we'll let the data scientists over there worry about using spark or whatever for their, their analytics. Spark is probably the one you know the best. It's certainly a very large active project. As I said, it started as a batch mode system as sort of a replacement for MapReduce, but as streaming got more popular, they first implemented a clever hack, which was to say, well, we can do streaming if we wrap around our, our batch engine the ability to capture data for fixed time intervals and then kick off little jobs, little batch jobs at the end of those intervals. And that was their mini batch model. The API was called Spark Streaming. But they've recently introduced a new lower latency streaming engine that's more of a true stream processing engine, and that's part of their structured streaming API. So there's a lot of choices when you're working with Spark. Mini batch is obviously the most mature in terms of years of use. Uh, the structured streaming is new and um, maybe not as, as fully baked yet, but it's 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 definitely the future for for Spark streaming. And also, Spark is great for doing batch stuff and things like SQL processing, they just sort of the DSL, the SQL language now I think is a superset of Hive's um, SQL, for example, uh, a rich and growing machine learning library and lots of third party libraries are integrated with it now like TensorFlow and uh, Intel's Big DL and so forth. So again, those Spark and Flink, those are the things that you use as I'm gonna run these services, I'm gonna submit big chunks of work to them and um, just let them run and figure out how to uh, partition that data over the cluster. But if you have maybe uh, really low latency requirements and maybe not quite as much volume, but you need a lot more flexibility in how you both process the data and how you integrate the, the stream processing with other things that you're doing, then you might consider using one of the library alternatives, Aka Streams or Kafka Streams. Um, oh, there's a typo on this slide too. Boy, I should have read these slides. So Aka Streams does not implement a, a beam runner. Uh, instead, uh, we, we've discussed this within Lightbend, but at, at this time it doesn't. And we're also working on uh, whether we should do SQL or not. But mostly what we're using Aka Streams for today is very low latency stream processing, but very rich semantics for expressing the data flows you might need. And then uh, one way we, we've used it in, in some of our client engagements, uh, just click the button there, one way we've used it is to actually um, uh, use it for that model serving case where you can 
uh, send messages to ACA actors to get new data, uh, new model parameters into the stream pipeline, and then use that to actually do scoring uh, you know, within the same JVM with low latency. So that's a really nice use case for ACA streams. Kafka streams is really oriented towards Kafka, and that's often really great. So what that means is it's not designed to talk to uh, databases or search appliances or REST requests, things like that. It's really oriented towards reading and writing Kafka topics, whereas Akka has a rich uh, connections library called Alpaca. But a lot of times it's all you want. You just want um, you know, to read data from a Kafka topic, manipulate it, and write it to new topics. They've done a really good job thinking about common use cases, and so they provide these uh, streaming semantics and also table abstractions, where a table might be, you know what, I only really need to see the last value for a given key. I don't need to see all of them that have come through. Or I'm gonna do some roll-ups, and so I'll, what I'm really gonna do is like keep it running average or something, and I don't have to see all the values that fed it. So the table abstraction in Kafka Streams is very handy. And they recently introduced a SQL uh, a, a tool. This is a little bit different than Spark, whereas in Spark and Flink, SQL is actually a library, just an API. In Kafka Streams, it's actually services that you run that let you do queries against running streams. So still very useful, but it's a different model. Okay, so you know, to kind of summarize a little bit, Spark and Flink, you know, rich analytics, lots of flexibility, best for working with massive data sets. Uh, Aka streams or Kafka streams are best for microservice integration and wider flexibility when that's important. Okay, so once again, here's the link for that paper, uh, the report rather that I wrote uh, some time ago, lightbin.com products fast dash data dash platform. And you can also then learn about what we're doing to provide commercial tooling around all of these um, uh, open source projects, uh, you know, integrated testing and all that stuff to give you something that's reliable in production. Uh, and here's that link again, and uh, now I'd be happy to take your questions. All right, thanks very much, Dean. Uh, you mentioned a couple use cases in your slides, including Nest. I'm wondering if you can share uh, another interesting use case that you've seen in the field when it comes to using streaming and also like fast data analytics? Yeah, so actually one of the reasons I sort of highlighted the microservice angle a little bit more with Aka streams and Kafka streams uh, in this talk versus ones that I gave last year is what we're finding is that a lot of people really do find that to be the right way to do uh, so-called stream processing. So there was a, uh, there's a telecom company in the US, I, I don't think I, I'm allowed to name them, but um, they had a situation where their, their old system was largely based on Hadoop uh, and some of the uh, streaming tools that some of the Hadoop vendors provide where they were trying to do processing during um, like major sporting events where there was some uh, promotion going on. And so there would be these big bursts of traffic and they needed to be able to keep up. And they were finding that their existing system couldn't do that. And what they did is, um, re-implemented that using this platform, but using Aka Streams as the streaming engine and just had like orders of magnitude performance improvements. I mean, lots of orders of magnitude actually. They, they were able to reduce the number of servers uh, that they needed in production by you know, something like a factor of five or 10. Um, and, and still uh, you were like 10 or 100 times, uh, had, uh, 10 or 100 times more throughput uh, with this new system. So a lot of times it really is avoiding the big heavyweight things and just focusing on something small and fast like Akka and uh, uh, you know, tailored to the particular problem you're trying to solve. All right, thanks. Um, a few people in our audience have, have kind of asked a similar question. So what if you're only building a fast data analytics engine and, and you really just want to use the uh, Spark and Kafka and, and pretty much keep it clean? Why, why is it important to apply streaming to your microservices architecture as well and kind of make sure all of these things are working together? Yeah, I think um, all of these things are sort of, um, you know, pick what you need and, and, uh, and don't deploy what you don't need. So for example, I don't expect anyone would use all four of these streaming engines as an example. Um, mostly what we're trying to support here and what we're seeing people need is 
you know, you may not be thinking so much that you're working with data today. You might be thinking more of I'm managing user sessions and users are doing work. But as you grow bigger, you tend to uh, get overwhelmed by the amount of data that's flowing through the system and you have to process. So that's why we think that you need the flexibility to be able to grow in that direction to exploit some of these uh, big data tools in a streaming context, even if you don't need it today. So you might eventually uh, decide that you really do have to pull on these things. And conversely, uh, if you're the data science team and you've come up with all these cool analytics, and you're gonna, your value to the company will obviously be accelerated or, or magnified, let's say, if uh, you're able to get those uh, results integrated into you know, what people are actually doing right now on the website. So yeah, I, th I think a lot of people either come at it from you know, classic services direction or from the big data world and will probably meet in the middle one way or the other. All right. So speaking of, of microservices architecture and how this kind of combines with fast data and streaming architectures, um, where do the concepts like event sourcing and CQRS play a role for, for streaming data? Yeah, this is, um, this is another area where there's just this kind of synergy emerging and it, a lot of it depends on your perspective. Um, in a way, Kafka supports the idea of event sourcing in the sense that it's captured this stream of data that for some configurable amount of time, and you can treat that as an event source that you replay uh, as much as you want, you know, or as different consumers come and go. Um, but in one case, you might be playing that as, I'm really treating these as individual events where I'm gonna do some complex event processing, but then another consumer might really think of it in this sort of record-oriented way where this is just a bunch of data, you know, structured data that I'm going to do some you know, global analytics over or something. So in my view, a lot of these ideas like event sourcing and CQRS will really come down to what, what perspective that you're bringing to your problem domain and the kind of problems you're, you're solving and whether or not the data that you're working with is something that you think of as event, <coughs> excuse me, events or just records. And the same data can be seen in both ways depending on the consumer. So that, that's the way I think of it is that all of these things make a lot of sense. As always with any pattern or idea, you just make sure you're not like you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, but actually applying something that makes sense and delivers uh, clarity and value to your system. But, but this sort of spectrum that we're laying out here actually covers that very nicely, as well as you know, supporting the data people who don't even know what the heck you're talking about when you talk about event sourcing or CQRS. Great, thanks for answering that. There's uh, quite a few questions appearing when it comes to you know, resources and, and what's kind of needed to even set up a test environment and, and start playing with some of these technologies. Um, what are some of the differences between the, the infrastructure resources needed and sizing that um, with fast data architectures compared to the previous batch model of, of Hadoop? Right. Um... One of the things that Spark did that was just so great when it came out in the Hadoop world was it actually was possible to easily run your Spark job just locally on your laptop as you're prototyping, working through the algorithm, uh, working with a test data set. And then you could just by flipping a switch sort of metaphorically, really just telling it, all right, you are running locally. Now I want you to run on this cluster over here. Uh, then it suddenly was able to scale to massive scales. I think all of these tools support that to some degree. There's even a way of running Kafka as sort of a, an embedded library within your application. So you could set up your development environment so that it really is like one big JVM you're running, but it's got Kafka in there, it's got Spark, et cetera, so that you can work out uh, the logic, a little bit of the performance testing that you might want to do in development. Uh, this is really important when you're learning Spark is understanding the impact of various constructs, but then take that and repurpose it to run in a big cluster. And then in the middle, though, typically what people do is they do stand up a development cluster. The ones that we use just uh, as a reference point, uh, you know, my development team shares like a 40 node cluster that's got everything running on it in our platform. And it's you know plenty big for 
uh, you know, submitting big jobs uh, versus small jobs, plenty of storage. Uh, and again, this is a benefit of Mesos and Kubernetes is that you can have people coming and going and needing resources, you know, like, I, like tonight I need just, you know, most of the cluster to do some big uh, job for analyzing last year's sales data or whatever. But then when I'm done, all those resources are freed and then somebody else can work with them. So that's the other thing. You don't actually need a big cluster, especially if you're not installing everything. Um, and you can tune these things to be fairly small so that you have the spectrum of everything from the laptop all the way up to a, your big production cluster. And it fits very nicely in a, your classic CI CD pipelines. Great. Well, Dean, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is all the time we have for questions. I do note that there are many of you that have uh, questions that, were, that we were not able to get to. Uh, if you're a Lightband subscriber, you can add those to the customer portal and uh, our engineering team and possibly Dean himself will be answering those, uh, those questions for you. Uh, also, if, it, if you feel like it's time to uh, find out a little bit more how Lightband can help you ramp up with Fast Data Platform, then you can simply write to me directly at oliver at lightband.com or you can contact us on our website and set up a 20 minute chat with someone. So Dean, thanks once again for joining us and I wish everybody on the call today a wonderful Thursday. Thanks again, everybody.